The parasha of this week is Behalotecha. This is a, a compound word that comes from the word Ola, that means to ascend, no? to go up. Uh, and basically, it starts about the, the lighting of the menorah, of the lamps, in, in, the, in the Mishkan. This is, uh, and I want, I have repeated this many times, but uh, only as a manner of uh, re repetition and re remember you, this is not a chronological description. Uh, sometimes I ask you this to understand because sometimes people try to put everything chronological. Most of are sages and rabbis, they really try to make everything chronological to try to say why this portion was put after this portion and after this portion, and they had the, the reasons and they, they link it one with the other. That's very rabbinical, and I like it sometimes, and sometimes I, I, I need to be independent. All depends on how we understand it. This portion uh, has certain areas, it's not totally comprehensive, only one subject, it has many subjects, one is the first of the lighting of the menorah. Then you want to have the induction to the fame, to the Levites. The Levites are going to be the replacement for the firstborn for the rest of Israel. It's going to be an esmicha. Esmicha is a, like an ordination, in order that you understand, posing the, the hands upon their heads. And then they want to put the hands upon the, the par or the, the, the cow, the, the bulls. And they want to be a totally, a, a, what do we call it, a, a ceremony that is going to represent the, uh, the process of the ceremony similar to the Sarat, the, to, to be cleansed completely, uh, to, to, to make us know that the, the living are purified, are taharot, clean. Look at, they don't use, in the, here they don't use the word kadosh because they already have been separated by God. Now what they want to be is to be clean, you know, and the, the process of taharot, uh, tahor, to be clean. Then, uh, in order to have a, a better uh, order of these uh, teachings, the day after that, uh, the, after the Levine, in which we uh, we are calling them to be part of our, our, our system, and, and God is, is putting them to, to serve uh, Israel, a rabbi said that why the menorah is put there? One of the reasons that one of the, the people that want to say that the menorah is there is because uh, Aharon, as a leader of the, the Levine, you know, he felt terrible that all the, the 12 tribes went to the Mishkan and offered something to God. And the Levine were the only one that didn't offer anything. But here you want to see two things that are very important. First of all, uh, they say the Midrashim, they say that Aharon felt really down and maybe he was feeling very guilty that the reason that there were no asked to do something was because his sin of uh, the golden calf. Uh, and because of him, all the tribes have been punished. But uh, God is going to give it to him a sign. The sign is going to be as follows. First of all, he's going to put in a position of ascending, getting up. And he's going to be the one that is going to light the light in the Mishkan. On, in order to give you an idea, the Mishka was a tent totally closed. There were no windows, nothing. Then when you get inside, that was totally, totally dark. You know? And then the only way that you could see something, then they turned the light. You know, at that time there was no ele electricity. Then what they need to do, they use the, the candle or the light, you know, the oil light, uh, candle. And then, the, the light will come out and then finally there will be illumination inside and they could be participating inside the Mishka. The second thing, if you read carefully, is the induction, we call it induction to the fame of, of the Levine, because basically they're offering the 
that the Leviim are doing, what is the offering that they are doing? Themselves. See? They are offering themselves. The other people brought cattle, they, they brought carts, they brought gifts, they brought a lot of things. But what the Leviim brought was themselves. And this is a, a beautiful picture for all of us. You know, many of us, we think uh, we can buy God. God cannot be bought. We do not have enough wealth to buy him because he's owner of everything. But we can offer ourselves to him what he calls us. And that is the step of faith that we need to have. It's a, it's a step of surrender and giving ourselves to him. It's a beautiful picture there that I hope that everybody can catch it and can make it for themselves. One, once the, the, the Levines are inaugurated and they are changing, then uh, we, we are going to uh, hear about the ordinance of the second Pesach, or Pesach Sheni. The Pesach Sheni is for those ones that they were not able to celebrate Pesach. Now, here the, the rabbis, the Midrashi, the Talmud, they talk about the Pesach Sheni was only for the, uh, uh, for the lamb. You know, the, uh, the Maxo or uh, uh, festival, because Pesach has two parts, you know, the, the lamb and the unleavened bread. And the unleavened bread, they, they could celebrate it in the regular way. But the only thing that they couldn't celebrate in the regular way was the land, and that was the reason that was the Pesach Sheni, that was one month later, on the Mount Sijar, day of uh, 14, when they needed to kill the lamb again for those ones that were not able. And who were those ones who were not able to celebrate the, the Pesach, the regular Pesach, those that were contaminated, especially with a corset. You know, and, and in that moment, you ask yourself, who were there, those who were contaminated with a corset? And you start thinking about it. What about the people who were taking uh, Joseph's body? You know, they were carrying Joseph's body all this, all this time. They, they were contaminated because they were carrying a dead uh, person, of course, you know, and they were the only one. A corpse. A corpse. No corpse. Corpse. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, now, you see, you rabbi has a lot of fun speaking English. <clears throat> I hope everybody knows that English is my ninth language. <clears throat> anyway. Anyway. The, the corpse, sounds good, contaminated the one who were carrying the body of Joseph. And that was the reason then. After that, we, we are going to also, uh, there are remembrances from what we saw in Shemot about that the, the Anan and the Esh will accompany the, uh, the community of Israel, the, the whole people of Israel during the night, the, 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 the fire, and during the day, the uh, cloud. Uh, and that was a part of the, that we have already seen before in the book of Shemot. Then we have the building of the two silver trumpets. Uh, the Lord instructed to Moses to make a silver trumpets. Uh, no, Esteh hasoserot kesef. Now, I mean this, uh, this trumpet for, was silver. Um, and the, he called to the Kohenim to, to blow this different uh, trumpet. And from here, you uh, celebrated with us Rosh Hashanah, who has a wonderful blower here, uh, the Tekiah the, and the Teruah, you know. And the, the idea is about calling to people assembly for the chief times, the uh, the all Israel and, and to reassemble the, the camp and to advance. And also to be prepared for war or for something special. Then the, the, the alarm was built in the preparing Israel to be ready for any circumstances. 
after this, after three years found to be in, in, the, in the desert, in China, they are going to move, finally, you know, they are moving on the second year of the second month, on the 10th uh, day, uh, uh, the 20th day, I'm sorry, they are ready to go and they start marching. Uh, as you just have here in our prayers when we do the Torah service, Kuma Adonai Beya Fuxu Obeja Beya Nusu Mi Paneja Mi Paneja That part, that part is in chapter 10 verse 35 of this parasha. And you are going to, uh, you repeat it over and over and you know what it is. And this is about, we are restoring, embarking us. And why with the Torah? Because when the Torah is in front of all of us, all Israel is together and Israel is protected. Well, that, that's the idea. And nobody can be against us. This is the idea about the, the, the reality of the Torah. Then, when we, we go through that, through that portion, and we are, uh, we are already singing about this, we, we are going to, to, to hear also the, 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 the portion we say, Shuba Adonai, Ritbot, Alfei Yisrael. Shuba Adonai, Ritbot, Alfei Yisrael. Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. And this phrase it could be interpreted in many ways, but basically what it's saying in these two special phrases that many of the rabbis say that these two, two verses, 35 and 36, are a book by itself, by the way. Uh, they represent the idea not only the protection of Israel, but Israel is going to be numerous. And also give us here a very beautiful picture that Israel, to be very numerous, is not only Israel of, uh, of blood, if we can put it in that way, but it is the Israel that has been added to the real Israel through the Bojims, the king, righteous Gentiles. Uh, they call it the Red Rab, the, the Asasov. There, there are so many terms that are used for this, and sometimes they are used in a very negative way. A rabbi has this wonderful thing. Anytime that Israel mis, uh, uh, behave, they were very quick to blame the Red Rab. You know? They are so quick to uh, yeah, like here in this community, if something happens, I will say, you know, the problem with us is you the Gentiles, you do not understand how the Jews. If you, you are the one that doing everything wrong. No? Uh, we don't have any fault. We're clean and pure. You are the, you are the problem. No? And, and this is the attitude that many, many say is have very quickly to blame the Gentiles for everything that happened to Israel. And we need to be careful about that. And you're going to see here in the process how much of Rabbeinu get to the point of leadership and it's fed up. But let me say this to you. As a principle that I already taught you, and I want to emphasize it again. When you are caught in a fault, be quick to admit it, be quick to accept it, and, and be quick to repair it. Longer than you take, harder it will be for you to make it right. And not only that, but you start building yourself up to justify yourself while you did it. And you start building excuses in such a way that pretty soon you have made such a strong case for yourself that there's nothing that can move you against that. All 
use us, we do that. And there are some that are more expert than others, but let me tell you, that is a very natural way to do it. There are people that they don't admit their own shadow, okay? They cannot accept that they have done, done anything wrong. Everybody else does wrong, they don't do wrong, okay? They're the perfect people. And when you find those people, run away from them. Because, to be honest to you, there is no way that you can win there. That's a lost, lost situation. Then, the people start complaining. Now, it's interesting. After only three days of journey, three days, okay, they started to feel excited with their trumpets and they are ready, they are ready to dance and, and conquer the world. They are excited about this new moon. And finally, what is say in the scripture? They start really complaining. And, and you know, do you understand what it means complaining? Mm -hmm. You start looking that everything is wrong, nothing is right, and you know what was better when we were in the other side. How many times I have heard people complaining about the situation and always looking back and saying, we were before, better than we are now. Why do we do that? You see, that's the same idea. We need to justify ourselves. If I fall in this place, I was deceived. To be honest to you, I, I didn't know what I was getting into. They, they lied to me, you know, because I was much better than the other place, but I didn't know any better, you know. They just said me. They didn't tell me the truth. And until I opened my eyes and realized what happened. And then, I want to be the rest of my life eating manna. You know, according to the rabbi, they say, it's very interesting, they say that the manna was delicious for the righteous people. <laughs> but uh, for the people who were very unreligious, <laughs> unreligious, <laughs> they were, they might not taste bad, like Ashkenazi food.
then. We are going to have here a very interesting situation. In the middle of this uh, is our dear Moshe Rabbeinu, who is going to have a, a basically, uh, I would call it a problem of identity, if I don't say it in that way, but uh, it, it is more than identity. It's a problem of, you know, I am fed up. Um, you, you will see uh, how he talks to God. I'm trying to look here for my notes. Uh, how he looks from God, um, and he is going to complain to God. But anybody, everybody talks about that. Moshe Rabbeinu was so special and so perfect and that he never do anything wrong, uh, and he was a, the the exception from everything. And he never uh, went out of line. You want to see that he was more than one out of line, as you can see. But why he was so upset? Verse 11, 11. I want to know my notes. And then I go to the cross. If I don't tell you what I need to tell you, I don't regret. I regret how here. We are in chapter 11 of the parasha. The, pe the people took to seeking complaints and it was evil in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord heard and his wrath flared and fire of the Lord burned against them and consumed the edges of the camp. Here, uh, by the way, because consume the edges of the camp, is it the one, the, the one that he consumed were yeah. all the Ebra because they were only outside the camp. <laughs> uh, I, I want to tell you the prejudice is there. The people cried out to Moses and um, pray to the Lord and the fire died, died down. And he named the place Taberah for the fire that she had burned it against them. I mean, it's burning, you know? And the rubble that was among them, <laughs> the rubble, <laughs> yeah, uh, here uh, uh, in verse 4, uh, you, you want to say that this is the ha asas suf, okay, from the word asaf. The asaf doesn't mean the ereb rab, even the rabbi, they say this is the ereb the, the, the rab, you know. Uh, what it means is the people who were complaining were gathering together. That's the multitude. The the big the big mouths were complaining. You know, you, you have those people that, that complain all the time. Okay. Now, let me ask you this simple question to all of you that you are not Jewish. Who are the greatest complainers in the world? Okay. I arrest my case, okay? You know, my son, the oldest one, he said to me, I am not Jewish anymore. And, and he complains that he loves to go on the bus, you know? And every day he has put at least three complaints. He, he goes to McDonald's and they don't serve him exactly at the time that, that he was. He, he launched a complaint. But I am glad that he's not Jewish. <laughs> It's in our blood. <laughs> we cannot get rid of that. We love to complain. Anyway, the complainer that was among them cultivated a craving. Okay? That means that the complainer were the one that they wanted to eat something different. And then, and the, uh, and the children of Israel also wept once more and said, Who will? Who will feed us meat? You know, I am tired of this manna. It's, it's not good for me. Who is going to 
We remember the fish that we ate in Egypt. Fritos, Fritos Church and the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks. You know, the onion and the garlic. Oh, it's so good. It's so good. And, no, and then he said, uh, but now our life is parched. There is nothing. We have nothing to anticipate. But it's so cold, man. You, you know, it's, it's terrible for him. You complain that way. Now, the man, the mana was like a coriander. See, that is the color was like a color of the bedolah. I don't know what is bedolah, but that's in the color. And, and the people will stroll and gather it and grind it in a meal, pound in the mortar and cook it in a pot or make it into cakes. And it tasted like they tasted a dog kneaded with oil. When the dew descended upon the camp at night, the manna will descend upon it. Most hear the people weeping in their family groups. They were weeping for garlic. You know? And the group, and each or one of them enters of his tent, and the wrath of the Lord flared greatly, and his eyes of Moses, it was bad. Mm. Moshe said to the Lord, <laughs> look at Moshe, a real humble, duly, goody, goody Moshe. Look at what he said. Oh, God, why you have done so much evil to me? What have I done to you to deserve this? You know? You, I am your servant. I have not found a favor in your eyes and a little mercy. Okay? You know, uh, do you place the burden of these people? These people upon me? What, what I have done to deserve that? Did I conceive the entire people? I give birth to them? I am the mother? I cannot even be their father and you are making me their mother. Do you know? And, and then you say to me, carry the name in your bosom. Moses say, as a nurse carries a stocking to the land that you swore to his forefathers, to his forefathers. Look, you need to, in the Hebrew, it's a very interesting. Moses, now, he makes an entity by himself. I have nothing to do with this people. They are not part of me. Please take it in our, you gave it to me. I didn't ask you. This is the constant struggle of Moses. And by the way, this is the constant struggle of every leader. A leader has, with his community, a love-hate relationship constantly. A leader loves them to death, and the leader loves them to death. What it means is, he wants to kill them. Okay? There is a true love. You know? Because it gets to the point that they cannot take it anymore. It's too much. Now, and then we say, where shall get meat to give to this entire people when they weep to me saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I alone cannot carry the entire nation, for it is too heavy for me. And it is how you deal with me. Then, please, kill me. I had it. Or I commit suicide. It's too much. I don't want it. Take me away from this road. This job is not for me. I didn't ask it. I didn't offer myself. I didn't give you my consent. No. You know, you put me here. And the only thing that I'm doing this is because you put me here, then. Now I don't want to do kill me. What can we do in a moment? A rotten follower, we can call it a way, disciple of God. 
This is what we see about the Hesed, the mercy of God and the love and kindness of God. I am so glad, I say to people, I am so glad that God knows I need, you know? Because in my case, I would disappear everybody in a second, you know? It's easy to, to, to eliminate these people that to, to deal with them, you know? And, uh, and he, I can see God smiling to him. I say, oh my God, poor Moses, let me hug you. <laughs> okay, cry a little bit and I want to give you a little bit. And then he, he said, uh, he the, the time that he is going to give part of the spirit that he has given to Moshe Rabbeinu to share with these other 70 members of his second inn of uh, elders. And here comes the story of Eldad and Eldad. Um, the story about how these extra two guys become prophet to even that they were not called and they run and they got it there outside the camp when they were inside the, uh, the niche camp, the other center of receiving the spirit of God. And this is another subject that is very interesting but I don't want to deal with this today, only I can tell you that when God decided to give his spirit to whatever he decided to give it, it's his decision, not mine. Even that, even that I say, uh, uh, he can say, I want to give it to the 70, and he added two more, it's his business. Uh, the, 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 what is interesting is about gematria, and sometimes uh, the numbers and things like this, but uh, the, the real, uh, uh, the number six is representing uh, men and, and will be, you know, instead to get 70, what did they get 72? It looked like that there was here is something that, that was a correction because he got six people from every tribe. Uh, you know, six by, by 12. Uh, you're a mathematician. Six times 12, 72. Uh, I am so glad there are certain mathematicians here, 72. But uh, he chose 70. Then what a number 70 means? The completion. Yeah. And what it means 72? Means that we have six, we have one member, a man, for tribe. You know, then you can get a lot of sayings there and building things and trying to explain things. But the, the point here, that I try to make for you at this time is that God has his reason and sometimes even that looks like a cure we cannot see in the first moment later on we are going to see it yeah. Yeah, and two, two. <laughs> uh, and then these two are put in there to reinforce what the other 70 are doing now Let's not confuse this second in with the judges that already Moses has instructed to help him. These are not the ones that are going to judge the people or going to... This is the, the, the prophets, really, uh, in certain way, the, the wind. The, the, the prophets, uh, uh, being a, the, the officers, the prophet, is the one that brings to you to correction, to, to guiding, and to bring words from God. Uh, many people think that the prophet is the only one that talks about the future, you know? And it's not only talking about the future, it's talking about the situation of the people, about their behavior and what God is telling them how they need to, uh, to, to, to conduct themselves. Now, finally, chapter 12, and this is the area that I really wanted to talk, and time is going so fast already. That, but uh, this is what I want to make my emphasis for this parasha for this week. And it's about the Lashongra, the evil talk. And here we are going to see it through the, the three uh, siblings, Miriam, Aaron, and Moshe Rabbein. Uh, Miriam Aaron, chapter 12, spoke. Now, here is very important. In the Hebrew, 
אני אעשה בתי גביר מיליאן היוסים לדרנליישון could be misleading because what he's saying is Miriam spoke against Moshe to Aaron okay Aaron didn't open his mouth but Aaron was a culprit he opened his ears Aaron could say to Miriam Shut your mouth, don't talk against my brother. Don't talk against your brother. He said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 You know, he was enjoying it. The, the <laughs> something certain people enjoy, no? Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. Oh, really? Wow! You know? I didn't do anything. I only listen. Let me tell you, more you listen, more gifted you are. Because you are part of the circus. Then, this is it. Miriam Aaron spoke against Moses regarding the Cushai woman he had married. For he had married a Cushai woman. In other words, Miriam was a racist. Here, what he said, Moshe Raven was upset, or, uh, I'm sorry, Miriam was upset with Moshe because he married a black woman. That, that's what we say here. You read it today, Hebrew? That's what we say. And they say, was it only to Moses that the Lord spoke and did he not speak to us as well? Well, let me tell you here, it's interesting, you know, when the rabbis uh, analyze this, this portion, the rabbis who like the black women and then they defend the black women. And there are rabbis who are against the black women and they go against the black women. But to be honest, you have nothing to do that she's black or not. She's a precious girl. What is important to see is that she was upset. Miriam was upset. But of course she was upset. The rabbis tell you, you know because you can see here, that Moshe has abandoned his wife. And you know, and this woman has done nothing to hold him. You know, when a, a woman cannot let her husband go, you know, hold it. She didn't. She, she was very reluctant to do it. They, they were upset with her in certain way. You know, because she didn't took the, the action to hold it. Others say, that he abandoned her because God has called him to, to dedicate himself to the people of Israel. Whatever is the circumstances, because we don't know anything, all is our conjectures and the imagination of the people. The truth of the matter, the only thing that has to do here is that Miriam spoke against her brother because she was jealous. That was it. But look at what he said. Was it only to Moses that the Lord spoke? Uh, and then, did he not speak to us as well? What did Miriam say? Oh, he did so much. What oh, he think he is? Better than me? I am. I, 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 I say her to him. You know, I was like a mother to him. And look, look and now I don't receive any credit. And he... He's the one that's put in the top. Aaron. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 I want to tell you, worse is the person who says, <laughs> than the person who talks. Be careful that you are those. <laughs> because you are worse than the others. Because you are incentivating that part. You are putting fuel to the fire, supporting. Okay. Now, the main Moses was ex and named. Did you know he speak as well? And the Lord heard. Okay, this is important. You know, uh, many.
many people they say this. Let me tell you a secret. <laughs> and I want to tell you that God has the greatest microphones in the world. We have better than iPhones and with those earphones. He, he has better than those things. He, he has uh, the best uh, audio system in the world. Right. Uh, you, today in, in the spy movies, you can see the, the people that put like an antenna and they can hear the three words behind, they can hear everything very behind. They have a better system than that. And even when you say, because he even can read your thoughts. Okay? Then when you think that you are saying something in secret, better believe me. There's nothing, nothing in secret that God has been known. And God heard Miriam speaking. And he said, Now the main Moses was exceedingly humble, more than any person on the face of the earth. And the Lord said suddenly to Moses, to Aaron, and to Miriam, You drink, go to the temple. Go out to the camp. You say when your parents, uh, when you were a little or young and, and you were misbehaving, and your, pa your father said, Peter, Joseph, you know, come in, go inside the house, I need to talk to you. <laughs> How did you feel? You were shaking and trembling, no? But the same idea. The three of them, they went inside the tent and the they are going to receive a reprimand from God himself. Now, and the three of them went out, and the Lord descended in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent. And he summoned out, they were outside, they were not inside, by the way. Uh, the summoned Aaron and Miriam, and the two of them went out, and he said, Hear now my words. If there shall be prophets among you, in a vision shall I, the Lord, make myself known to him. In a dream I shall I speak with him. Not so is my servant Moses. He is my entire house. He is trusted one. Mouth to mouth do I speak to him, face to face, in clear vision. And no riddles or image of the Lord does he gaze. Why do you not fear to speak? Again, my servant Moses. The wrath of the Lord flared up against them, and he left. The cloud had departed from the top of the tent, and behold, Miriam was afflicted with Sarat, like snow. And Aaron turned to Miriam, and behold, she was afflicted with Sarat. And Aaron said to Moses, I beg you, my Lord, do cast a sin upon us, for we have been foolish. And we have sinned. I like it, by the way, this answer of Aaron. Even though he didn't suffer the consequences, he never, ever excused himself. He had learned the lesson. You know, on the first occasion, what did he say? I threw the gold and poof! Come out, a, a golden calf. Now! <laughs> wow. For the first time, you see here. Look at, look at how important little principles you are going to learn from the scriptures if you follow the principles of the scriptures. He recognized the alternate medium of the heart and sing, Let her not be like a corpse, like a one who leaves his mother's womb with half of his flesh having been consumed. Look at the quality of Moses. Moses has been complaining to God, what do you bring me? I don't want to be the mother of these people. I cannot take care of them. I am fed up. And I am fed up my own family. And then, but as soon as happened to them, what happened? What does Moses remember? You deserve it. Go, rotten. Die. No? That was totally the opposite. Totally the opposite. But he said, he said, Cry out to her and say, please, Lord, heal her now. You know, heal her now. Rafa na la. 
heal her now. And the Lord said to Moses, even the here does not have the if, I want to add the if, in order to give a little bit of flavor to the, to the conversation. If were her father to split in her face, would she not be humiliated for seven days? Let her be quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and then she may be brought in. So Miriam was quarantined outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not journey with Miriam, was brought in. Then the people journeyed from Hazeroth, and they encamped in the wilderness of Paran. That's the end of the parasha. Very quickly, I need to tell you this. Reading these portions about complaints and leadership and being part of, of the people in the community. Even if you don't want it when you're trying to read and you, you study the scriptures, you, you immediately you, you take sides or you make yourself part of one person or one part of the other. You know, and all of us we struggle with what we read and what we see. I would ask, if I was at the time of Moses, and I was part of the group, and I, if I like so much garlic, I would be complaining because I don't have garlic? Maybe I will do it. You know, instead of trying to put myself, like many people say, if I was in that time, if I was born in that time, I would never do that. You know? I need to be, I need to be humble enough to know that I am very human. And I, have I will complain against Moshe Rabbeinu, Boy, that boy. Uh, I, I am looking at myself and I say, you know what? I will do it. And that is what is scary. Then I start knowing myself even better. But what about if I am Moses choose? What I will do? And I say, you know, he had a lot of patience. He took a lot. And for the people who didn't deserve his leadership, that was the problem. When you see it, you see that these people were not responding to him. They were not following him the way that they needed to. They, they, they followed him because they didn't have other choice. But they were not following him because they cared about him. Even his own sister was jealous of him because of your relationship with God. You know, how many times I have told you about the, um, when I started the book of the Midbar, about that God is a God of order and not chaos. And God, being a God of order, also is a God of functionality. And He's a God that He gives roles to people to fulfill. No everybody can be a Moses. No everybody can be an Aaron. No everybody can be a Levi. No everybody can be anything. God separate and give to each one their own places. The problem is when you start aiming others and looking at others, say they have more than me. Why they have more than me? You know, instead to look at yourself and say, how I can improve, or how I can be better. You spend more time envying others than looking at your way how you can improve. You know, in, in a boat, for one, he said, a wealthy man is the one that is satisfied with his lot. A wealthy man is the one that is satisfied with his lot. What do I mean to be wealthy? Wealthy means a person who is happy where he is, who is satisfied and he's living. Well, the person doesn't have time to envy others because he's busy with his own problems and his own situation and trying to help others and trying to be part of others. But I'm not trying to say, why this person has more than me? Why this person has been put in this place and I am not put in that place? Later on, we are going to see the rebellions of Korah and Dotan. And you are going to see these two 
people, one from the tribe of uh, the Levites and Tishad, and the other from the tribe of uh, Reuben. And you are going to, to see that there is an envy, because that supposedly was my place, and you took it from me. You took it from me, but God was the one that decided. You know, have you ever asked yourself, why there are so many people, they are so poor and there are so few people that have so much? What is not the inverse? What is not one of the people have a lot, and very few people have a little bit? You know, in God's essence, in the Torah, He's teaching us that whatever is given to you, it is not for your own use but it's to share. And, and he gives you more, you share more. He gives you little, you share little. But it's to share. It's not to hold it, but it's to give. I am the first one that I need to tell you that sometimes I mean, they call me a stingy, you know? A stingy or whatever. Stingy. stingy. You know? <laughs> And then suddenly comes a, a gift card from me and push! God made me do other things. No. But all of a sudden we have the power. All depends. But if we really, if we really, we are open to God's leadership, you're going to see that you start having less fears and you're going to have more opportunities to go out. And instead to look at others or what they have or what they don't have, it was opportunity to see about what God has given to you. Do you know that the greatest resource that you have is not outside you, it's you. Our problem is that we are always looking outside. And we are always complaining what all this has and what all this did and what all this happened and what all this, this thing. And we do not realize that the greatest resource that God has given is ourselves. Make while we have life, make while we have health, make while we have a, a situation of life or living, God has given the opportunity to keep going. You know, how many of us when we have a tragedy, or something happened wrong to us, we don't say, God, why you did that to me? How many of us will remember God when everything is come to God? You're going to see that sometimes we use God only in the times of need. When we say that God is always in front of us, Usually, it's only mechanical. And we really want to have a relationship with God is usually when we are going to a need. We are a needy people. And we are accustomed to use God only when we have a need. Our saints rely that about our humanity. And they develop a system from morning to evening, three times prayers, and going to the synagogue three times, and going to do this, and to put it, the, the tefillins, and, 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 and doing the prayers. Why? Because in that way, we, we, we were forcing ourselves to communicate with God constantly. As a process, as a method, could be good. But what happened with any method that men invent? become mechanical. And after a while, lose a reason and becomes only a method. We need to be careful that we do not fall in the trap. Have you heard the saying, familiarity produces contempt? That happened among us, but even worse happened with God. Don't ever call your father, Godfather, now call it Daddy. To me, that was the greatest 
lack of respect and reverence to God. And that became a, 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 a thing of the, of, the, of the time in certain groups, in certain religions. Oh, it's intimate me, my daddy. If you go to Latin America, where I come from, and you're going to see that your parents, you say, sir, man, you say, uh, you treat them with the respect and the reverence that they mean. Here, you go, hey, all men, hey, all women, hey, fatty. They call it the parents like that. And, and you know, I, I look at that, I'm sure. Why? Because one thing is love, and another is lack of respect and reverence. This is a process that we need to relearn all of us, especially in you know, the most involved cultures. And we need to go back to the respect and reverence. And let's be careful that familiarity doesn't produce content. All of us, we can be very good friends, but in all we need to be a line of respect and reverence. Don't ever cross the line, because you're going to be dead. Sometimes I say to you, I am your rabbi, and I am your friend. And sometimes people have problems to understand the difference between a rabbi and a friend. I can be rabbi and friend at the same time. There's no problem. But there needs to be a line of respect and reverence for everyone. If the rabbi doesn't respect you, he's not dignified to be called rabbi. And vice versa. There needs to be a mutual relationship of reverence and respect to each other. Doesn't mean that you cannot call each other with, with, with names of love and, and endearment. But this is the problem. Be careful. Be careful that you lose that reverence. That was the problem with Miriam and Aaron. He is our youngest brother. He is a baby in the house. Yes. But God has put his blessing upon him. He's special now. And he's representing not only your household, he representing the Holy Spirit, but he's representing God. You see how important it is? I, I have a fight right now against organized religion. Because organized religion, they put too many things upon people, rules and regulations. And these people who have enthroned themselves as the leaders, I call it enthroned themselves, you know, are, are the ones that give orders and tell you what to do and what not to do. And they ask you for all the reverence that, that they need to, to have, but they do not behave accordingly to that position that they have. Politicians are the same thing. They have a very high status. Judges and all those who were elected by the people. Supposedly the people have given them the authority, they have given them the support to be the leaders in those areas. Yet they deserve respect. When I go to court and I, let, I get up, when I see the judge, it's, it's a sign of respect and reverence for the position of the, the men who occupy. You know, because he represents the whole uh, judicial system. But what happens if a judge or, or a politician break their vows or they act worse than us? We expect from them better behavior than us. And right now, our situation is just the opposite. The regular citizens are more educated, better behaved than our leaders. is our brother's keepers. All of us 
we have a responsibility to each other. And the responsibility is done this way. Do not talk about others. Go directly to the person. In this community, we teach about this. Gossiping is destructive and is not helpful and doesn't help anybody. Totally the country destroyed. When you hear somebody talking against somebody else, you immediately you need to call that person to a place, let's say, because you are talking about, about somebody else. And I heard you have made me part of that problem. And I give you time to go to that person to talk directly, or I go to go to the person, I tell that person what you just said. You're going to see that in short time, you eliminate all the things. Yes, you have the right to call somebody to behave correctly or to act correctly. If you feel or you think that somebody has done something against you, you have all the right to go and confront the person and confront it in the right way. But I do not, do not talk against the person to others. Go to the person. Confront the person. And Messiah Yeshua told us in the Havesorama Tayahu, he said that when you see a brother doing something wrong, you know what you do is you go privately and talk to him or to her privately. If that, that brother or sister doesn't hear you, that person doesn't hear you, you bring two or three more witnesses with you. Two or three. And you don't say to the three women, hey, I want to put this guy, I want to tell him this, this. No, no. You say, I want you as my witness. I cannot tell you what I want to say until you hear. Because the only time that you can hear is in the moment they tell the person in their face. Not before. They need to know just in the moment. Then you go with those two or three and you tell the person. And if the person continues that behavior, what do you do? You bring it, he or her, in front of the whole community, and you explain what happened in front, and if that, that person continues in that type of behavior, the only thing that you need to say as community, yeah, not as individual, as community, you are not any longer welcome in this community. Please depart from it. Three steps. But you never ever did anything publicly until the last. This is the way that our Messiah told us. This is the, this, the way. Because there are two things that are destroying Israel and destroying the world. La Shomra, the evil tongue, and Sinachina, the gratuitous hatred. We, Israel, we suffer around the world sinachinam, and we know better than anybody what it means gratuitous hate. You know, wherever you go, wherever you go, you are going to see how the true intention of the people comes. Just not long ago, and I finish. I don't want to feel in a negative way, but I need to go. Um, they were playing in, in Europe, the basketball, basketball tournament. And there were two teams in the final. One is called the Real Madrid from Spain, and the other was the Maccabees from uh, Israel. Israel has only two real Israelis as a, as a player, and the rest were Americans <laughs> players. Okay? Uh, uh, but they play, they, uh, and I mention this about because. Even though they were representing Israel, they were not all Israelis. And they played in Spain, they played the final championship. And everybody, even the experts and everybody thought that Real Madrid was going to win far. But miracle happened. Maybe the Israelis, they were closer to God, I don't know. They pray more, I don't know. But they won. But by mistake or whatever, they won the game, the, the, the championship. 
The next day, start coming the worst atrocities of Spaniards against Israel and the Jewish people. I am sorry that you, uh, Hitler didn't finish his job. These Jewish people deserve the work. These are no people. These are animals. Terms that they were used, the, 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 you know, the real heart of Spain came out. We were spared in 1492. Still today, Spain is suffering because of that. They have been trying to make a right, some of the Spaniards, to bring back the Jewish people to be citizens of Israel. And there was an article in Firex, in the newspaper of, 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 of Israel, in Jerusalem, that they say, all of you Sephardim Jews who would like to go back to Spain, look at what can happen to you if you want to go back to be a Spaniard. You know? How we can take away the virus of hate against Israel? The only way that is going to be taken is when the Messiah comes back and is reclaimed for all humanity. Because no, it's not only Spain. Sadly enough, it's not only Spain. It's all Europe right now and it's all over the world. Even here in Canada and in the United States. We are start testing, testing the anti-Semitism against the Israel. It's growing and increasing. Why? Because this gratuitous hate is a virus that the whole humanity is contaminated. And only God himself can take it away from humanity. This is the reason why the Lashon Ra is so destructive and, and to hate people for no reason is not part of being human. Shabbat Shalom.